Today's subject is the Bible doctrine of sin. More law and more government. In getting a sane, simple understanding of sin, we must first take up a study of the moral law and moral government. Law means a rule of action established by recognized authority to enforce justice and prescribe duties and obligations to those governed. Physical law is the rule of action of the material universe, whereby all things are kept perpetually in their own courses and work in harmony according to the divine plan. Moral law is the rule of action for free moral agents to direct them in their moral action and their own creative powers according to the divine plan. It is the rule of free and intelligent action and liberty as opposed to the law of bondage and unintelligent action. The purpose of moral law is to reveal and to declare the rule of moral action of free wills concerning their highest good and the highest good of their own being and of the universe, and to govern the acts and intents of free wills and their relation to God and the universe. It lies in the reason, declares that which a moral agent ought to choose, will, and intend. The immutability of moral law, it can never change are vary in its requirements that all free wills consecrate themselves to the same end to which God has consecrated, the highest good of the universe and of all things therein. Rebellion of free wills will never change God's plan concerning the good of his creation because this, because of this, moral law can never change. We are all obligated to moral law and to, to obey moral law. Because it governs the best good of being, it is naturally, naturally obligatory upon all. What is contrary to the good of being is plainly illegal and unwise and must be prohibited. Free moral agents must cooperate to bring about the greatest public good. They must be against that which brings misery and hardships to society. It is a mutual plan for the good of each person and of the universe as a whole, and all are obligated to keep the moral law on every occasion according to the light received. To have moral law, there must be moral government to direct, guide, and control moral agents. It must include rewards for good and punishments for evil, or no society of free wills can function. There must be in every community some standard of living to which all must conform to prove themselves worthy of being part of that society. There must be some means of dealing with rebels who disturb such society. Law without penalties and reward is no law at all. It is merely advice which free wills can freely accept or reject without fear of punishment or hope of reward. Moral government is under obligation to execute faithfully the moral law to the letter. Since it is necessary to have moral law and moral government to execute this law, there must also be a moral governor whose will and decision are considered infallible by all the sub uh, subjects of the government. He should be authoritative, not merely advisory. He must be able to maintain the respect of his subjects by faithful and unselfish execution of his duties. He must be able to execute penalties and mete out rewards. Naturally, the one whose attributes and character best qualify him to rule and secure the highest good of all should be the one to rule. It is both his right and duty to be the one to rule. There can be no other person to meet these requirements but God. His natural attributes, his perfect and moral character, his relation to the universe as creator and his history of absolute justice to all qualify him to be the supreme moral governor of the universe. As our good and his glory depend upon mutual conformity to the same end, he is under obligation to require of us to be holy and consecrated to help him secure the highest good of being. It consists of free and intelligent action, this thing called free moral agency. So as we define that and keep that in mind, let us realize that intellect, includes reason and self-determination. The sensibility includes self-consciousness, all sensation, desire, emotion, passion, and all feeling. Free will, we might say, is the power of choice concerning moral law. It is man's faculty of choosing good or evil without compulsion or necessity.
It was originally created in man, and he will have it in all eternity. So we must believe in free moral agency if we believe in moral law and moral government. The basis of right choice should also be understood. Moral obligation to always act for the best good of all is the basis of moral action. Nothing can happen in life but what is the choice of someone. It is all important that right choices be made that will affect the greatest public and private good. Moral obligation extends to the ultimate acts of the will or to the intention. The moral agent is under obligation to choose holiness as the means to the best good and happiness of being that of himself and of the universe. Now, as to the basis of justice in moral government, judgment based on intention is the right basis of justice on, under moral government, and we recognize that even in civil government. If choices are made that had good intentions but did not turn out for the best, or if choices had bad intentions and turned out for, for, to be good, the one making the choice should be held responsible for the intention and would not be just judged on the basis of accomplishment. The Bible respects the intention more than the results of the outward action. All vice and virtue are considered as coming from the heart. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes the issues of life. Where the heart is right, all is considered right. And where the heart is bad, all is considered bad. And Jesus taught that when he said, by their fruit ye shall know them. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, neither can a corrupt fruit or tree bring forth good fruit. That we well know. Even sinners do some things outwardly that are required by God, but the heart is not right. The intention is generally selfish, and the acts themselves do not change the heart. Virtue consists of consecration to the same end to which God is consecrated. Vice consists in consecration to the end of which Satan is consecrated. That is, the end of self-gratification to the moral, or that is, contrary to the moral law and the good of the universe. Now then, as to the extent of obedience to the moral law, the foundation of moral obligation is the highest good of all. Since this is true, then entire consecration of free wills to secure this end must constitute Obedience to moral law. Obedience must be whole and entire and not half-hearted. One cannot choose the good of others and at the same time choose self-gratification. God cannot tolerate half-heartedness in choice and service. He so said to the church in the book of Revelation, the Laodicean church, I would that thou wert cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, he said, I will spew you out of my mouth. He cannot justify one who renders only partial obedience according to his life. If a person is always coming short of full obedience to known duty, then there is not a moment in which he is not under the curse of the broken law. For James puts it this strong, James 2.10, that if we would keep the whole law and offend in one point, we are guilty of all. God cannot dispense with the execution of the penalty until repentance, forgiveness, and full obedience are realized. Now then, of what does uh, disobedience to the moral law consist? It consists in the choice and life of self-gratification to the end in life instead of the greatest good of the universe. It consists in the commitment of the will and the consecration of the life to serve sin and Satan and the senses instead of the moral law of the intelligent. It seeks to be governed by the impulses and passions instead of by intelligence and reason. Self-gratification is the root of all sin. Man's selfishness is closely allied to the self-interest of Satan. The will is always free to oppose desire and lust contrary to the law, but when it does not, sin is committed. The mind knows its obligation, so when it chooses contrary to the law, it is not a choice of ignorance. It becomes a free action and brings condemnation by the law. Selfishness is always unreasonable. It is the denial of true manhood and rational nature. It is contempt of the law of God and man's reason. No sinner chooses the way of reason and common sense. He seldom consults reason for his action. He usually obeys lust and is 
in stubborn rebellion against the moral law of God and reason. He is lustful at heart, whether he can obey all lusts or not. As long as he remains so, he is condemned before God and needs regeneration to bring him to obedience to the law. The basis of degrees of guilt and virtue should also be understood. Both reason and revelation affirm that there are degrees of guilt and virtue, that some are more guilty and more virtuous than other. others, and that one may be more guilty and more virtuous at one time than at another, whether he is a saint or a sinner. All guilt and virtue are dependent on the exercise of moral obligation, and this depends upon the light and knowledge received concerning moral law. Degrees of guilt and virtue are measured by the knowledge of the value of the end chosen in life. The sinner's guilt is equal to his knowledge of the value of the interest he rejects. He is held more responsible today than of old because he knows more. A man's guilt of virtue then is equal to the knowledge he has of the subject that he has and understands and his conformity to it. Selfishness is the rejection of all moral obligation regardless of life. Sin lies in the intention, and this can be measured only by the knowledge under which the intention is formed and maintained. Thus, if a selfish man should preach the gospel, it would be for the reason that it is the most gratifying thing that he could do for himself. He might even preach for the good of others, and yet have as his chief motive personal benefits. Take away personal gain financially or socially, and he would cease to preach. The same man became a robber, it would be to the same end, not to do evil, but to gratify himself.